Bridge. He was involved in an automobile accident last night. That's why he's not here. Um, so I know him, you know him. For him, though, you care. Um, for that reason, we're uh, videotaping. Michael's back there, man, Cameron, and all this. For his benefit, we really appreciate you being here doing that. Um, like the first group, um, this group had a set of requirements that they had to work to, saying they had to have a uh, manned airplane with a crew station, had to have a payload, had to have landing gear, it had to be fairly conventional in nature. And they also had to develop their own requirements, they spent two or three weeks doing that. They had to build a business case for the airplane, basically a worldwide build business case in their case. Um, uh, so they got to choose their topic, they got to play uh, the requirement staff, the Pentagon to develop the requirements. Um, and then they get to the team, and they just uh, they have a model of their airplane that I believe is circulating around. Don't take that home with you. We'd love to have that back. And the team was led by uh, Bryce Nonis as a program manager, and Tara Ubrey was their chief engineer. He was also my cam during uh, UNIV 101, so I've got to talk to Tyler three folks. So without further ado, uh, they have something for the show. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the preliminary design briefing for the Toronto Aerospace Advanced Jet Training Proposal. My name is Bryce Mills. I'm the program manager. My name is Isaac Hine, and I am the propulsion IPT lead. My name is Trevor Douglas, and I'm the aerodynamic IPT lead. My name is Michael Norville, and I'm the performance IPT lead. My name is Chris Castillo, and I'm the structure's IPT lead. My name is Cam Fortuna, I'm the weight and balance IPT lead. My name is Adam Carpenter, and I'm the stability and full IPT lead. My name is Tyler Gurren, I'm the chief engineer, and I'm also the systems IPT lead. We're going to start today with an overview of the program. The T-38 was designed in the 1950s. It entered service with the U.S. Air Force in 1962. It was the world's first supersonic trainer and was highly effective as a lead-in trainer for third-generation fighters. It was adequate for fourth-generation fighter training. However, recently the U.S. Air Force has found that it is unsuitable for training fifth-generation fighter pilots, and as a result has released a set of requirements for its replacement. This program is known as the TX program. Before work on an entirely new aircraft began, existing, existing systems were considered to replace the T-38. However, after the analysis of alternatives was completed, what was found was that no off-the-shelf system could satisfy all of the U.S. Air Force's requirements. Additionally, modifying existing systems to meet these requirements would prove too costly to be feasible, and as a result, the decision to go ahead with a new aircraft was made. An eclectic design approach was implemented at all program levels in order to mitigate budgetary and technology risks. Several design, air design references were identified, with the four main ones being listed here. The AIDC Indigenous Defense Fighter in the top left, the Korean Aerospace Industries T-50 in the top right, and the Air Monty M346 in the bottom left, and the Lockheed Martin F-16D in the bottom right. The YT-80 Jackal was designed from the onset to satisfy all advanced training needs of the United States Air Force and future operators of fifth generation fighters. Due to its advanced systems capabilities and high performance, it is possible that in the future other entities besides the U.S. Air Force would be interested in acquiring YT-80 variants. The Department of the Navy is currently monitoring the TX program due to the possibility that the aircraft selected by the U.S. Air Force could be modified for carrier suitability to replace its fleet of aging T-45 trainers. Additionally, the weapons capabilities of the YC-80 as mandated by the Air Force requirements make it an ideal candidate for development into a light multi-role fighter. This would be intended for export much in the way that the F-5 was and would boost the defense capabilities of U.S. allies with small air forces. The primary design mission of the YC-80 is to provide the Air Education Training Command with a platform for basic fighter maneuvering training. From a design perspective, the most challenging phases of this mission are the sustained 6.5 G turn at 15,000 feet and the five 720 degree turning engagements. Additionally, the YT-80 was designed 
to provide basic surface attack training. In this mission, five strafing runs are made on a simulated target, each with offload of practice bombs and rockets. The final design driving mission identified for the YT-80 was the cross-country navigation mission. In this particular case, the YT-80 would be departing Edwards Air Force Base in California and flying cross-country to Joint Base Langley Eustis in Virginia, stopping only once to refuel at Vance Air Force Base in Oklahoma. It's important to note that each of these mission legs is to be completed on internal fuel only with a 10% fuel reserve. The longest leg of this is from Oklahoma to Virginia. That is a 1,049 mile cruise. And we will now discuss the selection and integration of the propulsion system. Thank you, Bryson. My name is Isaac Hine, and I will be going over the propulsion of the YT-80. As you can see above, the two engines we looked at are the current T-38 engine, which is the J-85, and the Honeywell F-125, which is the engine we chose. As you can see, the Honeywell F-125 has about double the thrust of the J-85 in both the dry and wet conditions, though the Honeywell F-125 has a lower thrust to weight ratio. In performance, we can see that the TSFC versus throttle percentage that the Honeywell F-125 outperforms the J-85 in all ranges. And we see a linear range from 30% to 100% throttle, which is where our YT-80 will be flying from. Looking at TSFC versus altitude, we can see that the Honeywell F-125 outperforms the J-85 in all conditions, wet and dry, in all altitudes. Our cruise range of internal fuel is 5,700 pounds, and we can fly 1,258 miles. This allows us to go cross country with one stop from Edwards to Vans to Langley. With an external tank of 370 gallons, we can reach an additional 400 miles. Going on to our thrust available versus thrust required at our maneuver altitude of 15,000 feet, we can see that we can reach a Mach of 0.94 with all max power and with afterburners, we can reach a Mach of 1.26 at our maneuver altitude. Going on to our cruise altitude, we can see that we can reach Mach 0.95 with max military power and Mach, Mach 1.42 with full afterburners. This, is, this shows that we can reach our cruise Mach of 0.77 at altitude. In designing our inlet, we went with a simple normal shock inlet due to the fact that we were going less than Mach 1.5. Using Raymer's approximation, we found our inlet area to be 2.3 feet squared, which is maximized for our cruise altitude and cruise speed of Mach 0.77. Dealing with the boundary layer, we went with a simple boundary layer splitter so that we can reduce cost and risk. In the nozzle design, we went with a simple convergent divergent nozzle to allow us to go supersonic speeds. Next, we will be going to aerodynamics. Thank you, Isaac. My name is Trevor Douglas, and I'll be talking about the aerodynamics of the YT-80. First off, in the airfoil selection process, we looked at airfoils of supersonic fighters. We found a common trend of four to 5% for the thickness to chord ratios of these fighters and we chose the airfoil featured on the F-16 Falcon, the NACA 64A204, for its proven efficiency as well as its 4% thickness to chord ratio, which will reduce our supersonic drag. The YT-80 features a mid-mounted trapezoidal wing. The crop tips provide a high angle attack, low drag uh, maneuver, and also the long uh, root cord provides a decrease in the structural complexity of that area. The total plan from area for the YT-80's wing is 282 square feet, which was determined by our constraint plot, as well as the leading edge sweep of what was initially 30 degrees it was moved to 35 degrees in order to fix a static margin shift and also will reduce our supersonic and high speed drag. It also features aspect ratio of 3.34 and a span of 29 feet. Here is the CL alpha curve of the YT-80. It is important to note that this does not take into account the effects of the leading edge root extension. You can see that the CL max is 0.75. However, in order to meet our 8G limit load factor, which we talked about later in performance, we need a CL max of 1.52. Therefore, leading to the need of a leading edge root extension. Also, our angle of attack of 20 degrees requirement, which we'll also be talking about in the performance section, 
we, it's clearly seen that we only reach a 90 degrees angle of attack, therefore we also need the leading edge root extension to increase our angle of attack. Also, our takeoff for our Max is 1.6. This was deemed by our constraint plot, which we talked about in performance. This, was, this is with a 10 degrees leading edge flap deflection and also a 20 degrees trailing edge flap deflection. And then for landing, we have a 10 degrees leading edge flap deflection as well as a 45 degrees trailing edge flap deflection, leading to a CL max of 1.84. For the sizing of our leading edge flaps, we compared the YT-80 to other fighter and military trainer aircraft. It can be seen that the YT-80 in orange does not affect, however, the trend line on the plot. The YT-80's percent core calculated using Roscoe is 16% and features a 72.3% of the span. However, this is 100% of the available span, which is also typical of the other fighter aircraft analyzed, which have a 70.7% average span and a 17.2% average core. Going on to the trailing edge flaps of the YT-80, it features a 32% core for the trailing edge flaps. Although compared to the other fighter aircraft, it is rather large. However, it does have a smaller percent half span compared to the 43.3% half span of the fighters and the 26.8% core of the fighters. In sizing the leading edge root extensions, we mainly looked at past historical data and compared the ratios of the leading edge root extensions and plant form areas of those fighters and military trainers, as well as for the length of the aircraft and the length of the leading edge root extensions, therefore to properly shape our leading edge root extension. This resulted in a 32.14 square foot leading edge root extension and a 9.65 length of our leading edge root extension. In order to determine the effectiveness of our leading edge root extension, we took this plot from Brandt, which shows the effectiveness of the leading edge root extension for the F5. This resulted in our CL max increase to 1.57, which allows us to meet our 8G load limit maneuver. However, we are unable to analyze the change in our angle of attack with implementing the leading edge root extension. Therefore, we are unable to analyze if we do meet this requirement, we'll have to push it off into wind tunnel testing later on. Here is our CFE and CD not comparison. The CD knot of the YT80 is 0.0191, which was calculated using a drag component breakdown, which can be seen in the auxiliary slides. The CFE value used is 0.0035. This was chosen due to the comparison of average fighters, which had a CFE of 0.00352. Again, these are fighters that were analyzed, so therefore we chose our CFE value in order to reasonably over predict our drag. Here is our takeoff and landing CD knot as well as the CD knot for our BFM and BSA mission. You can also see the CDX terms for our takeoff with the flaps deployed, the landing gear deployed, as well as the landing flaps and the landing gear deployed. This was in order to analyze our performance during these flight regimes. Here is the drag puller of the table shown before. On the very left, you can see the clean configuration, and on the very right, you can see the landing configuration with the landing gear deployed. In order to figure out our CD knot versus MOF number, we used a three-line approximate method and then compared it to the T38 flight test data. It was expected that we have a higher CD knot term in the subsonic regime, and then you could also see the transonic spike. However, we do feature decreased uh, drag as you go past the sound barrier. This is expected to actually increase compared to the T38 flight test data. Making note of our max CD knot of 0.04, at a MOF number of 1.04. In order to optimize the T38's fuselage shape for a low transonic drag, we then took the area along the length of the aircraft and smoothed it through removing all discontinuities in order to compare it to the Sears hack body for the optimal case. And next, to Rockwell Aerospace, we'll talk about the performance of the YT-80. Thank you, Trevor. I am Michael Norville and I will be discussing the performance for the YT-80. So the YT-80 must be able to meet all the following requirements given by the U.S. Air Force uh, Advanced Jet Trainer proposal. One significant uh, point about this requirement is that 6.5 G sustained turn can be performed with a piece of S loss of 200 feet per second. Typically this would be done with a specific uh, power loss of 0 feet per second. 
Also, Toronto Aerospace is not able at this time to verify if the YT80 meets the angle of attack requirement of 20 degrees until further wind tunnel testing is done. The constraint plot shown here uh, was used based on the Air Force requirements released previously on the previous slide. Uh, the two limiting constraints for the YT80's design point was the landing constraint and the AG instantaneous turn constraint. This results with the YT80 having a thrust weight ratio of 0.84 and a wing loading of 70 pounds per square foot. And this constraint plot was generated with the help of uh, Roscoe McBook. The takeoff and landing distances shown here were used to calculate the landing and takeoff distances on the previous slide. The takeoff distance of 4,800 feet was determined by using 60% of the total runway distance, and then the landing distance of 3,600 feet was determined by taking 75% of the takeoff distance. This was recommended by both Roscoe and Nikolai's book. It's important to note that uh, the, these distances are pretty large, and that's due to the fact that the 8,000 foot runway would be at an elevation of 7,400 feet. By setting lift equal to weight and drag equal to thrust to required, we developed an Albert E versus Bach number chart, varying uh, with elevation. The cruise condition of the YT-80 is at 35,000 feet flying at Mach 0.77. This results in a cruise Albert D of 10.4 uh, and a max Albert D of 10.9. This flight envelope here of the YT-80 shows that the YT-80's ceiling is 52,000 feet. Uh, also, the YT-80 is capable of going past Mach 1, however, it does not get past the transonic drag spike. With full afterburners, the YT-80 is capable of going at Mach 1.45. Also, if you note, the PCBS contour of 0 feet per second is flat at the top. This is due to the fact that the engines of the YT-80 can operate at 70,000 feet. However, in an engine out scenario, the pilot still needs to be able to maintain control of the aircraft. In this case, the, the max elevation for the YT-80 to fly in an engine out scenario is 53,000 feet. This turn rate diagram shows that the YT-80 is able to meet both the AG instantaneous turn requirement and the six and a half G sustained turn requirement uh, without afterburners. Um, the AG instantaneous turn would, would occur with a turn radius 2,500 feet at 18 degrees per second flying at Mach 0.75. The 6.5 G sustained turn would occur at, uh, with a turn radius of 4,300 feet, a uh, turn rate of 13 degrees per second and flying at Mach 0.88. This uh, occurs with a specific power loss of 200 feet per second. With full afterburners, the YT-80 would perform the 8G instantaneous turn at, at 2,600 feet with a, a turn radius of 2,600 feet, a uh, turn rate of 18 degrees per second at Mach 0.76. The 6.5 sustained turn T, or 6.5G sustained turn could be performed at zero feet per second as normal sustained turn would be performed. And uh, it would have a turn radius of 4,000 feet and fly at Mach 0.86 with a turn rate of 13 degrees per second. And now, Tarako Aerospace will discuss the structural arrangement of the YT-80. Thank you, Mike. I'm Chris Castillo, and I'll be discussing the structures of the YT-80. Shown here is the VN diagram for the YT-80 at three different altitudes. The altitudes shown are sea level in blue, 10,000 feet in orange, and 15,000 feet in gray. The the altitudes of 10,000 and 15,000 feet were chosen because that is the altitude at which the AG turn, which is the driving, the driving factor, will be conducted. It is worthy to note that the corner velocity at 15,000 feet is 595 knots equivalent airspeed, and at 10,000 feet is 554 knots equivalent airspeed. These correspond to 0.9 Mach and 0.84 Mach respectively. Using the AG load factor, strength's approximation was calculated for the wing. This takes an elliptical ideal lift distribution and scales it with the core length of the wing. By integrating this, you can achieve the shear distribution shown on the left. 
And by integrating that, again, using the trapezoidal approximation, you can achieve the moment distribution shown on the right. Using the moment distribution, an initial sizing of the spars in the wing structural design can be found. Shown here is the wing structural configuration. It consists of a multi-spar design, design that is seen among fighters, among common fighters today. There are attachment points for the hinges for the flaps, both leading and trailing edge, and for the ailerons, which are placed over. The empennage configuration is shown here. The horizontal tail follows a similar multi-spar configuration, similar to that of the wing, with a hinge box located between 30 and 50 percent of the root cord in order to allow the full horizontal tail to act as an elevator. The vertical tail consists of a two-spar a two-spar configuration with ribs located at hinge locations for the rudder, and they are perpendicular to the leading edge spar in order to increase structural efficiency. Shown here is the structural configuration for the fuselage with the wings and empennage attached. The fuselage consists of seven bulkheads. The first two are placed fore and aft of the cockpit. The next two are placed on the leading and trailing edge bars of the wing. The next one is placed at the interface between the, the duct the inlet duct and the inlet of the actual engine, and then last two are placed at the leading and trailing edge spar of the vertical tail. In order to increase the structural efficiency of these bulkheads, the main the nose landing gear is placed is a, is joined to the bulkhead which holds the aft portion of the cockpit, and the main landing gear is attached to the bulkhead which contains the trailing edge spar of the wing. The bulkhead which, which holds the trailing edge spar of the vertical tail also is used to support the engine and support the, the horizontal tails. Frames are placed in between each of the bulkheads spaced between 16 and 18 inches apart as recommended by Rostam and were attached by long drones which were, which were spaced about a foot apart and are about two inches thick also as recommended by Rostam. Next, we will discuss the weight and yeah, the weight and balance and landing gear design of the LT. Thank you, Chris. My name is Cam Fortuna, and I'll be discussing the weight and balance and the landing gear design. Using Roskin's method of averaging similar aircraft with design missions and performance classes, we're able to come up with an initial estimate for the empty weight. We then subtracted a 4% adjustment factor to account for advances in technology and material to result with an empty weight of 13,145 pounds. Using that previously found empty weight, we then added the max fuel, max payload, payload layout, fuel, no, crew, trap fuel, and oil to result with a gross takeoff weight of 22,510 pounds. Taking the partial derivative of the takeoff weight with respect to the payload, and to weight range, fuel consumption, and LOD, we were able to calculate the sensitivities. With a 5% increase, the corresponding takeoff weight increases are shown. And the empty weight range, fuel consumption, and LOD were all design driving with respect to their impacts on reducing the overall weight and when using the Brigade range equations. Using historical data, we were able to compare the YT-80's clean takeoff weight to similar aircraft. The green points represent high-performing trainers, the blue represent fighter and attack aircrafts, and the orange point is the YT-80. It can be noted that the trend line shown is independent of the YT-80. Again, using the historical data on the high-performance trainers and fighter and attack aircraft, we can compare the takeoff weight with external stores of the YT-80 to these aircraft. And once again, using the historical data on these aircraft, we are able to compare the YT-80's internal fuel weight to these aircraft. Displayed are the landing gear designs created in Katia. The nose gear is a one, or one major strut with a minor collapsible strut. The wheel diameter is 18 inches with a tire width of 4.4 inches. 
The strut length is 4.1 feet and these will retract backwards into the fuselage. The main gear has two struts with one being collapsible. The wheel diameter is 22 inches with a tire width of 6.6 .6 inches. The strut length is 5.4 feet and these will retract forward into the fuselage. Using Raymer's text, we're able to find the placement of the landing gear. Using a tip back angle of 18 degrees, a static tail down angle of 14 degrees, and a tip over angle of 55 degrees, we found that the nose gear is 120 inches from the nose, and the main gear are 323.5 inches, er, inches from the nose. The height from the ground to the center of gravity is 72.4 inches, and when fully extended, the main wheels are 58.5 inches from the setup. And now we'll be discussing the stability and control. Thank you, Cameron. My name is Ivan Carpenter, and I'm going to be talking about the stability and control of DYT-83. This is our longitudinal X plot, which plots our aircraft aerodynamic center and our aircraft center of gravity as functions of our horizontal tail array. To help meet our maneuver requirements, we decided to size our static margin to be 4%. This gives us a horizontal tail area of 48.7 feet squared and a stable CM alpha. This is also very close to the Roscom recommended value of 5% for static margins of aircraft in this category. This shows our static margin travel over the course of our basic fighter maneuvers mission. As you can see, we start out at about 4% stability and travel to about 2% um, instability. Our worst static margin is for the empty aircraft, which so with uh, no pilots, no fuel, and no payloads. This static margin is about 10% unstable. This was the static margin we used to calculate our feedback control gain uh, required to control the aircraft. For this value, we calculated 0.57 degrees per degree. This gain is the amount of elevator deflection required per angle of attack deflection. Roscom says that anything below five degrees per degree is reasonable, um, reasonable to control with modern flight control on. Our vertical tails were sized uh, to meet our stability at high angles of attack and spin recovery re requirements. A general rule of thumb for spin reco recovery is that no more than two thirds of your rudder area can be blocked out by your horizontal tail. As you can see, we easily meet that requirement as just slightly over a third of our rudder area is blocked out by our horizontal tail. However, we anticipate that at high angles of attack, we will get similar wake lines coming off of the wing as well. So we added those and the top portion of the rudder area becomes possibly effective. However, even with that, we still have about a third of our rudder area as good effective rudder area. This sizing method gave us a vertical tail area of 75.23 feet squared, which in turn gave us a value for CM beta of 0.166 inverse radians, which is stable. Um, and as you can see, this is within the historical range of CN beta values. So the tail sizing we just discussed and the general shape of the YT-80 um, ends up giving us a CL beta value of minus 0.23 inverse radians. As you can see, this is also within its historical limits. Despite this being stable, we still want to be as maneuverable as possible. So our ailerons were sized to the upper bounds of our historical limits, which is what the plot on the right shows. The green lines are the historical limits and the blue dot is the YT-80. There are two main parameters that determine pitch behavior at high angles of attack. They are wing shape and horizontal tail placement. This slide shows the wing shape. The next slide will show the horizontal tail placement. Uh, the general trend for stability for wing shape is lower aspect ratio and lower sweep angle will make the aircraft more stable. As you can see, the blue dot, which is the YT-80, is just below the green trend line, which is the trend line for fighter aircraft. Therefore, we anticipate that the YT-80 will be more stable than most fighter aircraft. There are four main regions an aft horizontal tail can fall into. They are region A, which leads to a reversal of the CMCL curve and leads to the deep stall phenomenon. Region B has an unfavorable pitch break and can lead to pitch up without warning. Region C can have an unfavorable pitch break at supersonic speeds. And region D does not have an unfavorable pitch break regardless of, uh, regardless of speed. As you, can see, as you can see, due to the anhedral in our horizontal tails, we are in region D, and therefore do not anticipate any pitch behavior issues at high angles of attack. Our requirement for our engine out scenario was to be able to fly at at least 1.2 times our stall speed. However, what we found was that because our engines are so close to our fuselage center line, our minimum control speed is actually well below our stall speed, 
and therefore the in and out scenario is not mission critical or design driving. And next up, we will talk about systems and human factors. Thank you. So my name is Tyler Gurren. I'll be talking about systems and human factors today for the YT80. So the seating configuration for the YT80, we've actually chosen to use a Martin Baker Mark 16 injection seat. Uh, this was done for several reasons, the first being that it's already a proven system on platforms such as the F-35 and the T-38. So implementing it into our system would already reduce program costs because we don't have to develop a new system for our aircraft. And it's also proven in the battlefield, or it's been proven in service. Um, tandem seating has been chosen over side-by-side -side seating. Uh, this has been done because tandem seating provides better pilot visibility for, for both the instructor and the student, and also provides more of an authoritative uh, visual aspect for the instructor so you can see what's going on and see if there's anything that the student needs or any requirements that he needs. Um, for the pilot accommodations, we've chosen to use the, the 5th to 95th percentile for male pilots. Uh, this includes gloves, helmets, uh, all their accessories. And then we've also chosen to use the 30th percentile for female pilots. This was done in accordance with uh, both Roscoe and Raymer's method. So cockpit requirements, again, according to Raymer, the over and angle for a typical military or trainer type aircraft uh, should be around 11 to 15 degrees. And for our values that we measured, we're about 11.6 degrees with our current system. Uh, the instructor overlook angle, or the angle that the instructor sees all over the student's head, should be about 5 degrees, or it's recommended 5 degrees. Uh, we said about 5.2 degrees for that angle. The over the side angle, for the, the over the side angle, or the angle that the pilot sees over each side of the aircraft uh, for increased pilot visibility, is recommended to be about 40 degrees. Uh, currently, we set about 42 degrees for the instructor and about 31 degrees for the student, which is a little bit below uh, what the recommended value is. And for pilot headroom, it's recommended that a 10-inch radius uh, be used for uh, the eject for the ejection seat or the egress system in order to provide adequate clearance. Uh, we said about 8.3 inches and then about 4 inches for the instructor. Although this is a shallow value, uh, it's it's similar to what's seen on current systems such as the T38, which is about 5 inches headroom for the instructor. So here's just a visual aspect for our cockpit arrangement. Again, we can see that the 11.6 degrees for the overlook angle for the uh, the mannequin in the front or the student, and 5.2 degrees for the instructor overseeing the pilot side. Uh, this angle is going to change a little bit with the addition of a helmet, but we believe we've added enough uh, clearance or enough um, a, a difference in there to account for that. So then this is uh, forward looking aft of our aircraft, and this visualizes the overlook or over the side angle for the cockpit. We can see we have about 42 degrees for the instructor, and we also have about 31 degrees for the student. So this is the typical cockpit arrangement for the YT-80. Uh, we can clearly see that the main focus of the cockpit is the uh, L3 system's large area, large area avionic display. Uh, this will be used to display information such as payload information, uh, mission information, also display critical flights of, or aspects of the flight such as uh, yaw pitch, roll, and it will also display you know, velocity and altitude. Um, both cockpits are very similar in design, the only difference being a button on the instructor's side, or a kill switch, that gains control over the aircraft in case the student uh, loses control or is then unable to um, perform the task at hand. So the instructor will always have a, to, will always have a, a authority over the, over the flight deck. And because weight is an important issue for our aircraft, and we knew that there was going to be a large, uh, large weight for avionics in the electronics bay, we wanted to include that in our preliminary design. So here we can see the access locations as well as some of just a, a dummy card file of what the aircraft electronics bay would look like. As we can see, it's, it's located just in front of the cockpit or in front of the forward bulkhead of the cockpit. Again, these are just uh, dummy card files uh, in future iterations and especially in detailed design, we'll actually list what avionics, what packages will be listed inside this compartment. So listed as a standard mission configuration, the top figure shows just the YT-80 aircraft. Uh, this is the typical cross-country navigation uh, mission. And we can see or it, its payload requirement is 100, 140 pounds of payload for the pilot and the instructor. This is to be carried internally inside the flight deck. Uh, below that, we have our BFM training mission. And this includes two LAU-129 rails to house the Cabin 9X and the ACM iPod. Uh, this is, uh, these will be used for the training missions at hand. Uh, for the BSA training mission, it will include the four previous systems I just mentioned, as well as one SEDU-20 practice bomb dispenser, six BDU-35 25-pound practice bombs, 
and four Mark 69 flares. So in-flight refueling is a issue or it's a requirement for our aircraft. Um, there are two types of in-flight refueling uh, systems that we could have on the aircraft. There's something called a dry hookup and there's also one that's called a wet hookup. A dry hookup allows pilots to interact and allows pilots to actually interface with the refueling aircraft. However, no fuel is transferred between the two aircraft. This is simply just for a training mission. Uh, a wet hookup allows fuel to transfer from the refueling aircraft to the trainer aircraft. And so the YT-80 will actually implement a wet hookup for our aircraft design. Uh, as Bryce mentioned earlier, we have plans or there are plans to, to reuse this aircraft or export this aircraft as a military joint strike fighter. And with that, we'd rather implement the system currently than rather than re-engineering um, re uh, the future system or having to go back and redo drawings just to implement the system when it already is a requirement for the aircraft. And now for final conclusions for the YT-80. Thank you, Tyler. So listed here are the total engineering hours for this program for the semester. The total came to be about 2,000 hours with professional development at about 500 hours, taking up the most of these. Referencing the requirements discussed throughout this presentation, it can be shown that at this time, all requirements that are verifiable have been satisfied. With the exception of the 20 degree angle of attack requirement, this will be deferred until the detailed design phase. And with that, we have found through our analysis that the YT-80 is in fact a competitive aircraft for the TX competition and Turaco Aerospace recommends continued development of this aircraft into the detailed design phase. Thank you very much. At this time, we'll address any questions the audience may have. Hopefully they're pretty quick. Um, my, my first thing is just a comment. Um, it took until slide six to mention your aircraft. Um, I would put that more up front, say what you're going to present. I just knew who you guys were. I didn't know exactly what was going to be presented until a bit later. Um, I enjoyed the, uh, the AOA, the analysis of alternatives. Um, that's good that you guys had that in there. Uh, slide 15. So you had a training mission for a uh, cross country going from Edwards out to Oklahoma and so on. Um, Edwards isn't really a training base for the Air Force. Um, they're out of, I believe it's Texas, I think there's one in Colorado. Um, why do you guys use uh, one of those bases instead? That is a good question. I think the the main driving factor behind that was we wanted to show we wanted to choose the westernmost Air Force base we could find just to get an idea, just in case it was ever necessary to do that. Uh, I don't, like you said, it's not really used for training, so I don't know for sure. But in the event of the need for, I think a better way to put it would have been a ferry mission, just because it's likely that during evaluation it would need to be. Edwards Air Force Base to other locations, for example, for delivery to the Air Education Training Command bases in the Midwest. Um, so on the slide, here, you mentioned a 370 gallon external tank, but I didn't see it mentioned anywhere else in the presentation. Did you guys just not do any more analysis with it? Oh, that was originally uh, calculated for a long cross country. Uh, when we did it further iterations, we found that our internal tanks were uh, great enough to uh, meet our requirements for the crews, so we didn't do any more analysis on that. Okay. Um, with the engine analysis, which engine did you guys choose? It wasn't written down on any of the slides. 
Oh, uh, I stated that it was the Honeywell F125. Uh, we were comparing the t our choice engine to the T38. Okay. Let's run an auto work. Just going back to the slides and let's see. Um, so slide 24, and kind of going on with a lot of these slides, this is um, the same comment pretty much throughout, is if you guys could list or even label those points of what you compare these things against, um, that'd be extremely helpful. I, I realize on some of the other slides you had a lot of data points where you would just clutter up your graph, so maybe like a list on the side saying, hey, we looked at these aircraft. For these initial sizing for the flaps, uh, they were using the uh, planes mentioned at the beginning that Bryce mentioned during the uh, planes that we analyzed in order for this entire design process. However, later on it does feature more aircraft, so that would be a good you, point. You did have a label on one of the graphs. I was like, oh, there it is. Sweet, now I know what you guys have compared it against. I forget which slide that was. Uh, slide 36, and I've asked this for pretty much every single group. Um, single engine takeoff analysis. Did you guys look at that at all? If you lose an engine on takeoff? Uh, yeah, so that whole reason behind that was the 60% uh, distance we took into account of the 8,000 foot runway. So, in case you have an engine out scenario, you could safely stop in time before they run the runway. So, you end up stopping, you abort the takeoff, you want to keep going? Uh, yeah. Okay. One other question. Um, so on slide 57, this side view, were you guys going to have a radar installed on this for training purposes? Is that what that green thing is in the front of the nose, or is that the electronic spray? No. So the green, the green thing at the front of the nose, that's actually the. Those are the access doors for the uh, electronic spray. We're not going to have a radar on board to the reduced wave. We'll have a simulated radar system. So we're gonna have air-to-air -air or air-to-ground simulated radar on top of the aircraft, or data link to the aircraft, so we can proficiently train. Okay, so you just do a simulated. a simulated system. And I know you guys are gonna go over it, uh, but it is on your backup slides, like slide 100. I would recommend not using this uh, this thing from the F-35. Um, Couple reasons is one, it's not really proven yet. Um, they still have a lot of work to do to get this thing actually working right. And the second reason is how expensive it is. I think it's around like half a million dollars just for that helmet. So, along with that cost thing, did you guys do any cost estimates? Um, look at operating costs and compare that to any of the alternatives out there and why yours is better? In fact, we were specifically instructed not to include that in this briefing. However, just in case we did perform them, they weren't included as auxiliary slides, but I can tell you what we found using Roskam's cost estimation methods was that the unit price you'd be looking at was approximately $23 million. This is compared to the T-50, which I believe is about $21 million, somewhere in that range. The M-346, I believe, is in the low 20 millions as well. The indigenous defense fighter, the, there's no trainer variant, they looked into it, but we were using the B model, which is two seat, as a design reference, and that is around, just because it's a, it's a dedicated fighter, uh, it's, that's around 25, 27 million. So we were, as it was, we were a little bit on the high end of, the, uh, of our competitors, the T-50 and the M346. Operating costs, we were looking at our goal was we knew we were going to have higher operating costs than the T thirty six. I'm sorry, the T thirty eight. They're using the F sixteen D right now for conversion training. They have operating costs of around six thousand dollars per flight hour, from what I recall. The T thirty eight is around two thousand. What we calculated for our operating costs was about four thousand dollars per flight hour. So that was within our goal of between the two. Okay. Awesome. Good job. Anyone else have any questions? 
the non-senior PIA? Who's taking this next year? Who's taking it next semester? 